In the next two minutes, you'll see a series of mixed up scenes. Because we can't show you what really happened, we'll have to tell you. We're getting now to the heart of this matter, the police hosing, which the committee calls the, quote, communist-led riots. First, you must know that there were two police authorities in operation at City Hall on this particular Black Friday. There was no apparent liaison between them. On one side was Sheriff Carberry. On the other, Inspector McGuire of the city police. The sheriff seemed to be working in one direction, the inspector in another. Naturally, there was confusion. Friday morning, the sheriff approached the students saying, in effect, wait in the rotunda and I'll try to arrange for you to be admitted to the hearing room. Through no fault of his, Sheriff Carberry could not make the necessary arrangements in time for the afternoon session. In the meantime, the responsible student leadership made several attempts to cooperate with the police. They were rebuffed. They sensed the danger in the situation and made frantic efforts to contact the mayor or some other responsible city official. No one was available. At noon on Friday, the students thought their efforts were to be successful, that at last they were to be let in on a first-come, first-served basis. And again they were treated to the spectacle of the pass holders being admitted ahead of them. They felt cheated. They felt they'd been betrayed. Sheriff Carberry had led them to expect the afternoon sessions would see admissions on a more equitable basis. Ironically enough, the sheriff had done as he promised. He'd gotten the permission he was after, and he was on his way back to City Hall with that information when the hosing began. Under Inspector McGuire's direction, a squad of policemen moved up the City Hall stairs. The students quieted down. They expected the police to make some statement, some request for them to leave the building. But nothing was said. The committee's version keeps emphasizing that the students were warned. It's true the police ask a few individual students to leave, but there was never a general warning to the students. No hint was given of what was to come. Out of the sight of the students, the police began uncoiling the fire hoses. The students tried to demonstrate their nonviolent intentions by sitting down. Some witnesses heard a policeman shout something to this effect. So you want some of this, do you? Well, you're going to get it. And then the water was turned on. That's what really happened. But here's the committee's version of what happened. When one officer warns that fire hoses will have to be used if the crowd does not disperse, the demonstrators become more and more unruly. One student provides the spark that touches off the violence when he leaps over a barricade, grabs a police officer's nightstick, and begins beating the officer over the head. As the mob surges forward to storm the doors, a police inspector orders that the fire hoses be turned on. Well, you surely know that Robert Meisenbach was acquitted in his San Francisco trial. If you saw Life magazine of May 23, 1960, you saw a photograph of Meisenbach standing perfectly dry over against the wall of the rotunda, looking on while the students were being hosed. Not even the committee will suggest a communist trick so adroit that a man can touch off a riot, beat a police officer, be drenched with fire hoses, and get away, all dried off within a matter of seconds. It can't be done and wasn't done. Even the officer who supposedly was assaulted admitted at the trial there was no barricade jumping by Meisenbach. And another curious fact. Despite all the experienced press and television cameramen on the spot, all the footage that was taken, no one has come forward with a single frame showing anyone jumping any barricade. Nor, as the committee would have it, quote, any mob surging forward to storm the doors, end quote. Do you see anything of that kind here? You can bet that if it had occurred, someone would have pictures of it. And you can bet at even longer odds that if such pictures existed, the committee would have publicized them far and wide. Look at these scenes of police rousting students from City Hall. Which group is using all-out violence? The students or the police? And just suppose, for the sake of argument, 
that a student had leaped a barricade and assaulted an officer. That would certainly be grounds for his arrest. But would that, if it occurred, have justified the police in handling all the students in this way? The fact is, no one leaped a barricade. No one assaulted an officer. Then why did the police use the hoses? Only the police know that, and they aren't saying. There has been a widespread awareness, not only in San Francisco, but nationally, that the evidence points to brutality and violence on the part of the police rather than on the part of the students. We ask you to draw your own conclusions. Remember that most of the scenes you saw just prior to the hosing were actually taken the day before on Thursday. But the makers of Operation Abolition weren't satisfied with the truth. It wasn't dramatic enough. It didn't prove their point about a communist-led riot. So by combining the two demonstrations, the film editors were able to create a distorted, untrue but persuasive effect. As we said before, Representative Walter has tried to defend himself by saying the errors in the film are purely accidental. You know now they were not accidental. When the committee subpoenaed the film from the photographers, all sequences were properly dated and labeled. There was no excuse for error, no excuse for mixing up the true sequence of events. It's a matter of record that at least seven students were injured. What Operation Abolition didn't include was the original newsreel film showing injured students lying prostrate and apparently unconscious on the floor of City Hall or outside on the ground. Such scenes were carefully deleted by the committee's producers. In contrast, see now what tender concern they have for the police. In the words of the original narrator. And none injured. Four students suffer minor injuries. Eight policemen are injured to the point where they require hospitalization. Five officers were seriously hurt. Two suffering heart attacks and three are treated for deep cuts. Here you see patrolman Frank Dunphy, aged 61, who suffered a stroke when he was knocked down by student agitators. This makes a good story from the committee's point of view. But the truth, as shown by the official police report, is that Officer Dunphy merely collapsed from exhaustion. And other police injuries were minor. Why shouldn't they be minor? No one was turning hoses on the police or dragging them downstairs. And all eight policemen were back at full-time duty within three days. The committee also falsely tied in the students with communism by declaring that, just before the hosing, quote, students enthusiastically join in on the refrains to the song, abolish the committee, we shall not be moved, lyrics to which are lifted from the old communist people's songbook, end quote. Actually, we shall not be moved is an old religious spiritual, well known to people acquainted with folk music which appears in hymnals and is presently the theme of sit-in demonstrators in the South. These are the arrested students being booked. Later, charges against all but one, Robert Meisenbach, were dismissed. And Meisenbach was acquitted by a jury after less than three hours of deliberation. Now, with all the talk in the committee's film about communist leaders and communist dupes, only two of those arrested are even alleged to be communists. And these two joined the group only after the hoses were turned on. So even this flimsy pretext by the committee of communist provocation of police falls flat. Now the film shows you some more so-called evidence of communists agitating California students into opposing the House Committee on Un-American Activities. This includes clippings from the Daily Californian and the San Francisco Chronicle. The implication is that these news stories on events surrounding the hearings 
are a result of communist inspiration. Showing a page from a newspaper obviously doesn't prove this claim, nor do continuing scenes of pickets and crowds taken at various times during the hearings. Again, you will see actions of some of the witnesses under subpoena in the hearing room. You're informed in Operation Abolition that in some way these witnesses